Number one, you need to leave your medical. Uh, med I don't know. So there are numerous video clips showing the inside of the home and the disarray it was found in by detectives, along with 911 calls, pictures of Danielle's journal, and emails between her husband and a woman he reportedly had an affair with. My husband's deceased. There's been a tragedy at my home. He's stiff and he's been wounded. He might have had a heart attack. He poured himself a drink really heavy, and then he started skewing. Realizing the rage was going on in there. He would often say, everything will be okay as long as I hide the steak knives. Oh my God, he didn't hide the steak knives. Miss Redlick armed herself with a knife. She used that knife to cause multiple injuries to Mr. Redlick's body, causing him to bleed to death. This audio was recorded on the evening of January 11th, 2019, when Michael Redlick dialed 911 urgently, reporting a woman posing a threat to herself and others. He promised to call back in five minutes, but never did. This marked his final call, as the following morning, Michael was found deceased. Uh, I don't know. I think my husband's deceased. There's a tragedy at my home. What's the, what's the address up there? One, two, three, one, Temple Drive, Winter Park. What's going on at 1231, Temple Drive? I believe my husband is deceased. Okay. And why do you believe he's deceased? Because he's been, I, I just, he's stiff and he's, he didn't want it, he might have had a heart attack, I don't know. Okay, did you just find him? No, actually, it happened last night. It happened last night? Correct. Okay. How old is your husband? He's 65. So did you find him this morning? Because I know you said that you believed it happened last night. Did you see him last night? Was he okay or was... He was not okay last night. We had we had altercation and he stabbed himself and I ran into the bathroom and then when I came out, I tried to help him and I saw he was lying in blood. And then I tried to help him and I couldn't Correct, yes. And then I tried to help him and I thought I woke up sitting up next to him and I was trying to figure out what to do. Right. So you all had an altercation last night, correct? Yeah. All right. Are there any weapons? On scene now? Uh, nice. A knife. A mm knife? Mm-hmm. Okay, so Danielle, let me ask you this. So did he stab himself last night and he passed last night and you just didn't know what to do? Correct, I believe so, yes. Okay. Were you all drinking? He was. And an uh, altercation was the night before too, but I left the house and took my children with me because he was dancing them too. Mm -hmm. Were your kids there last night during this altercation? No, they were not. They were not here and they're not here now. I know you first said that you thought he had a heart attack. So do you think it was a heart attack or do you think it was due to the stabbing that he passed away? Um, probably the stabbing triggered it, I guess. I don't know. It's a shoulder wound. You say it's a shoulder wound? The following morning, Danielle Redlick called to report Michael's death, claiming he may have stabbed himself during an altercation the previous night. Investigators were puzzled as Michael had been killed over 11 hours before the call. As details of their relationship emerged, questions arose about whether Danielle acted in self-defense or committed cold-blooded murder. Born in Florida in 1976, Danielle Redlick grew up in a loving and secure environment despite her parents' separation during her early years. She pursued her education at the University of Central Florida, graduating with a Bachelor of Arts degree in interdisciplinary studies focusing on communication. Danielle furthered her studies with psychology courses and obtained certification in photography, showcasing her intelligence and ambition. Around the age of 22, Danielle's mother, Kathleen, met Michael Redlick, often referred to as Red by his friends due to his last name. 
Described as a kind and generous man with a warm smile, Michael's character attracted Kathleen. Their relationship appeared happy, with Michael being supportive and loving towards Kathleen and her children. Despite not being officially married, Michael embraced the role of stepfather to Kathleen's children, as he didn't have any of his own. He seamlessly fit into the family dynamic, with two of Danielle's siblings residing with the couple while the others lived with their father. During Danielle's college years, she regularly visited her mother, siblings, and stepfather, Michael. Although Michael was a qualified lawyer before meeting Kathleen, he found success as a businessman during their relationship. He held executive positions in professional sports organizations like the Cleveland Browns and the Cleveland Cavaliers. However, tragedy struck in 1997 when Kathleen was diagnosed with advanced breast cancer. Kathleen, Michael, and the six children were deeply affected by the devastating news of Kathleen's advanced breast cancer. They not only faced the impending loss of their mother, but also lacked the financial means to cover her treatment. Despite their humble background, Michael was determined to support Kathleen. He proposed marriage as a solution, ensuring she could access his comprehensive healthcare benefits through his executive position. This would cover all expenses related to Kathleen's cancer treatment, allowing them to move forward once she recovered. After only two years together, Kathleen and Michael's shotgun marriage was a rational decision, driven by the hope that the modern healthcare system could save Kathleen's life. Despite Kathleen's deep love for Michael, their marriage was primarily for convenience. Tragically, Kathleen's breast cancer had advanced to stage 4, and despite exhausting all treatment options, she was given only months to live. Just months after their marriage, Kathleen gave in to the illness. Danielle, deeply affected by her mother's passing and concerned for her siblings' well-being, was approached by Michael. Michael, who had been looking after Danielle's younger siblings with his partner Kathleen, offered Danielle a place to stay in their home. He hoped Danielle could act as a maternal figure to her sister, especially since she was struggling with their mother's death during her critical final year of high school. Agreeing that Danielle's presence would offer comfort and stability, they decided it would be best for her to move in and support her sister through this challenging time. After moving in, Danielle and Michael initially focused on household responsibilities and offering emotional support to each other and Danielle's sister. Michael also offered Danielle career advice, leveraging his extensive business experience to guide her as she moved forward into the professional realm. Over time, as Danielle increasingly sought Michael's emotional support, their relationship evolved from a platonic, mentor-like bond to a romantic and intimate connection. While Danielle was balancing her studies with a part-time job as a bartender, Michael began visiting her at work, initiating casual conversations amidst her shifts. This casual interaction gradually evolved into Michael taking Danielle to various activities and events, initially perceived by Danielle as harmless bonding. However, as Michael started lavishing gifts on Danielle and dedicating more time to her than anyone else, Danielle's feelings deepened into infatuation. The turning point came when Michael introduced Danielle to a business contact, helping her land her first professional job. Feeling grateful and indebted to Michael, Danielle's relationship with him took a turn. Over time, what started as a platonic bond between Danielle and Michael transformed into a deep, physical connection, ending in a serious, romantic relationship. This was Danielle's first experience with such a commitment, and she was genuinely in love. Aware of the complexities due to Michael's past role as her stepfather, Danielle understood the potential difficulty in gaining acceptance from friends and family. So, they initially chose to keep their relationship private to avoid the likely public disapproval. By then, Michael had been appointed as the executive vice president of the NBA basketball team, the Memphis Grizzlies, requiring a move from Cleveland to Memphis. When Michael discussed the relocation with Danielle and invited her to join him, she hesitated and ultimately declined. Danielle was aware that moving with Michael would certainly expose their relationship to her family. Despite their two-year romantic involvement, she felt unprepared for the following scrutiny. She chose to support Michael's career move while opting to remain behind, planning frequent visits to Memphis until she felt ready to acknowledge their relationship openly. After Michael relocated to Memphis, he arranged for Danielle to visit him every weekend. Upon her arrival at the airport, Michael would pick her up, and they would embark on a series of whirlwind romantic dates. These weekends away from her routine life in Cleveland, where she lived with her sister, gave Danielle a temporary escape into a world filled with romantic gestures and quality time with Michael. He took me to um, um, a place called Mud Island, where um, it's a beautiful neighborhood on the Mississippi River in, in Memphis, and 
he pulled up to a home and he went inside and he said, I bought this for us. And it was a beautiful house, it had a pool and it was on the river. And so um, from there, I, I, I went ahead and made the decision to go ahead and move to Memphis. So you're there on a visit and he told you that he'd already bought a home for you? Yes. Or for you together? Right. Okay. At this point, how was the relationship? Um, it was good. I mean, like I said, odd, odd circumstances how we came together, but it was good. I, I enjoyed, we enjoyed our, our time together. And how did the rest of the family view this at that point? Um, I don't, I think, um, the, my, the sister that was living with us, I think she took it kind of hard, which I don't blame her. Um, I think people were a little bit shocked, but other than that, um, didn't have much to say about it. During one of her visits, Michael surprised Danielle by driving her to an attractive house in the Memphis suburbs. Upon their arrival, he revealed that he had bought the house for her, expressing his desire for her to leave Cleveland and permanently live with him. Touched by this grand gesture, Danielle accepted his offer and agreed to move to Memphis to be with Michael full-time. In the fresh setting of a new city, Danielle and Michael found the opportunity to present themselves as a legitimate couple, free from the constraints of their previous lives. Embracing this chance for a new beginning, they decided to solidify their relationship through marriage in the early 2000s. Despite the expected backlash and criticism from friends and family, the couple portrayed themselves as loving and committed partners. Yet, despite their freedom and resolve, their relationship had flaws and challenges. In their marriage, Danielle, inexperienced in long-term relationships, found herself partnered with Michael, who was 21 years her senior and had significant life experience. Michael held a position of seniority over Danielle, having already established himself in a successful career while she was navigating her own professional path. Despite these challenges, the couple endured and welcomed two children, Jaden and Sawyer. Michael embraced fatherhood wholeheartedly, mirroring his previous role with Danielle's siblings. Despite the demands of his professional life, he remained actively involved in his children's upbringing, providing support in any way he could. As the children grew into their high school years, Danielle observed a decline in Michael's romantic gestures and availability, leading her to suspect cheating. Confronting him confirmed her suspicions, causing immense hurt and betrayal. Despite this, Danielle prioritized providing a stable home for their children, aiming to avoid the instability she experienced growing up. Choosing to remain with Michael, they attempted to salvage their marriage through therapy, both individually and together. However, the damage caused by the cheating was irreparable, resulting in a loss of trust and escalating into frequent verbal and physical altercations between the couple, often witnessed by their young children. Facing ongoing infidelity and escalating conflicts, Danielle confronted a difficult decision, whether to remain in the strained environment or to leave. Ultimately, she reached her limit and chose to end the relationship with Michael. Their separation led them to live in separate homes. Michael's reaction was one of anger and hostility towards Danielle. He threatened to cease payment on their shared home and restricted her access to joint accounts. Additionally, he threatened to pursue full custody of their children and evict her from the home he was financially supporting, potentially forcing her to return to Cleveland. Despite this, Michael expressed a desire to reconcile. Despite their separation, Michael proposed to Danielle that if she allowed him to move back in, he would continue to cover their expenses. After a few months apart, Danielle initiated divorce proceedings in 2018. However, the judge rejected the filing because Michael successfully evaded being served the papers. He managed to avoid process servers multiple times. On one occasion, he pleaded with Danielle for another chance to salvage their marriage for the sake of their children, promising to change, a plea Danielle accepted. When the process server arrived to deliver the papers to Michael, the couple were together, and Danielle assisted in avoiding service, once again allowing Michael to evade the legal process. During their attempt to reconcile, Michael began inviting Danielle over for dinners at his condo, taking her out on dates, and showering her with gifts and expensive outings. Danielle found herself in a state of confusion regarding the nature of their relationship. While she perceived them as separated and working to mend their marriage, she also had suspicions that Michael might have ulterior motives or still be involved with other women. This confusion turned to anger when Danielle stumbled upon a letter written by Michael. How do you feel at this point? After, after reviewing that, what's your mindset? I'm shook up by it because I was surprised that he was saying this when we were clearly trying to 
get on better. And is so what you're seeing there matching the interactions that you are having with your husband? No. After observing that, after having this experience, did you speak with Michael about it? Did you confront him about what you had found? Yes, I asked him about it. And is that what leads to this email exchange? Yes. Could this anger have driven Danielle to commit murder? Or were the years of conflict and abuse the cause for her reaching a breaking point, leading her to defend herself against an attack by Michael? Having been together for 18 years and married for 15, Michael's death on the night of January 12, 2019, marked a tragic end to their relationship. Upon Danielle's call, the police arrived, confirming that Michael had been dead for some time. Instead of succumbing to a heart attack, authorities discovered that Michael had been fatally stabbed. His body lay in a pool of blood, indicating a recent disturbance. Bloody towels littered the floor near the body and throughout the house, while the scent of cleaning products filled the air. Evidence suggested that Michael's body had been recently relocated, evidenced by blood smears on the floor. Upon the arrival of the police, Danielle was in a frantic state and was subsequently taken to a psychiatric ward for evaluation regarding the risk of self-harm. Meanwhile, an investigation was initiated and the family home was sealed off as a crime scene. Refer to everything we see here as suspected blood because you haven't done some tests to actually truly confirm that it's blood. That is true. Uh, but a, it's a pretty strong suspicion. Yes. Okay. Upon her release from the psychiatric ward, Danielle returned home, only to find herself under increased suspicion, as Michael's autopsy revealed he had died from a single stab wound to the chest, causing death within five or six minutes. This contradicted Danielle's account of events, leading authorities to consider her a prime murder suspect. A search warrant was executed on Danielle's home, where she maintained her innocence despite mounting evidence against her. Following police interviews and Danielle's peculiar behavior following the altercation with her husband, she was charged with second-degree murder, despite being offered a plea deal to plead guilty to manslaughter for a reduced sentence of 10 years, Danielle opted to proceed to trial. During this trial, the unsettling details of the incident in their suburban home were revealed. Danielle maintained that she had been fighting for her life, acknowledging that she was the one who stabbed Michael. However, her defense rested on a claim of self-defense. Ms. Redlick, on January 11th, 2019, did you stab your husband? I did. Yes. That he ended up um, pushing, pushing her to the ground, pushing her to the ground. And then did she get up? Yes. What did he do next, according to Ms. Redlick? Um, pushed her head against the stove and began like covering her, covering her mouth with her, her face with his hands, okay. yelling and screaming at her. So she's described, can you kind of describe what you understood um, her to be saying Mr. Redlick was doing with his hand? Like just covering, like smushing her, his hands with, over her mouth. Okay. N she was not describing being choked? Correct, she wasn't. Did she say whether or not Mr. Redlick uh, struck her at any point during the sequence of events? No, just smudged his hand against her, her face, but like, like that, okay. like smudged it. Like was r like rubbing his fist yeah, on her? Yeah, like rubbing, mm-hmm. You're face to face with Miss Redlick, right? Yes. Nothing covering her face? Right. Um, did you observe any injuries on her? No. Danielle detailed how their relationship had been mostly positive, but incidents of domestic abuse began long before they relocated to Memphis and before she discovered Michael's unfaithfulness. I remember I made an offensive comment, which I wouldn't make today. Um, I, I called him, I said he was, I said at least he wasn't um, Jewish and cheap. And he backhanded me in the face and mouth, and my mouth started bleeding and my nose started bleeding and we were in the car at this point and so when I got to the red light I wanted to get out of the car and he grabbed me and I grabbed him back and we kind of just went back and forth in the car and we actually got uh, pulled over. She shared how Michael's behavior gradually worsened, particularly when he consumed alcohol. He was coming home from work every day and he was pretty agitated. Something was really bothering him. I just remember that it was something had to do with something with two of his bosses and um, he was coming home and he was pouring a drink each night, and um, I, I was so pretty young at that point, so I grew up in a house where you eat dinner every night, and I noticed that Michael, when he would drink, he would skip dinner, and so he was doing this by the third night. Um, I started to wonder, you know, are you going to keep doing this? I think I'm just going to go ahead and, if you're not going to eat dinner, I'm just going to go down to the, to the river. There's some, you know, a city walk where they have some shops and eateries and stuff. And 
When I said that, he got irritated and said, what, are you mad because I don't want to have dinner with you? And I said, well, yeah, kind of at this point, because I said, how's the wallowing working out for you? I said something sarcastic, and I went to head to the door to leave, and he was near the door, and he moved in front of the door. And um, I tried to shove past him, and I feel like at that point, he just, he raises his fist, and he just crossed me in the face, and I feel like, I don't know, like he took out every frustration that he had had that week on me, and um, the next thing I remember was actually laying in his lap, and he was stroking me, and he was apologizing, and he was crying, and um, I had looked down, and I had blood all over me, and he was telling me how sorry he was that He's going to take me out to a nice dinner tomorrow, and he wanted to go ahead and take care of me, let him take care of me that night. Witnesses also recounted their experiences of the violent relationship between Michael and Danielle, citing incidents reported to the police. Additionally, evidence revealed that Michael had been prescribed testosterone and medication for erectile dysfunction. He became increasingly frustrated and insecure about his sexual performance, expressing fears to Danielle that she would leave him because of these issues. His insecurity escalated, leading to instances of sexual aggression alongside physical violence. He was going to be going out of town for a work function um, for the week. and. So he called me from work um, the day before and said, I'm going to bring home some movies and dinner. We're going to spend some time together tonight. And I said, OK. So he brought home dinner and alcohol. And we started watching the movie. And there was a love scene. And this happened often, I noticed. He would get um, flustered and kind of start acting strange. And um, during this particular movie, he approached me. And he was aggressive. And um, you know, I, 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 he was hurting me. So. I moved to a separate couch, and I, I told him that that wasn't okay. And he just continued to drink through the movie, and he passed out about halfway through. And I finished the movie, and at that point, I just went upstairs to bed. I turned everything off, and I let him know that I was going up to bed. He was snoring. Um, I didn't wake him up, so I went up to bed. And the next morning, he had to leave, get ready to go out of town, and then he came upstairs into the bedroom, and he said, why didn't you wake me up last night? So when he says that, how, how does it continue from there? Um... So I'm in my bathroom at that point, and I'm brushing my teeth, and um, we're having this conversation. And the next thing I know, something hits me in the back of the head, and I look, and it's there's a box of tampons on the floor. And I said, "Did you just hit me with that?" And he said, "Yeah. Are you calling me a USSY?" And I said, "No. What are you talking about?" And he said that I had left the box of tampons on his side of the sink. What was I trying to say? And this is just was very strange to me. And I said, I don't know, those were just, this just happened to be there. I didn't do that on purpose. Didn't clean up the bathroom, sorry. And I was upset. And I said, maybe you are acting like that, um, a P-U-S-S-Y. And I walked away from him. And he How came, did he react when you walked away? He said that he came up behind me and grabbed me from behind and started choking me. And um, I had never been choked that hard before by him um, you did this a second ago can you show the jury how with, with your hands do a demonstration um, forearm, he just came up behind me and yanked me really hard and pulled me close to his body and to the point where i couldn't breathe and he cut off my um air and basically it was choking me out um i started to pass out i remember falling and i remember thinking to myself is he oh my god is he going to kill me and i remember reaching up and i fell to my knees and the next thing i know i was sort of aware and I was looking up at him and he was just staring at me with this like surprised expression on his face and he just he reached out his hand and he said I'm sorry and I just crawled away from him into a corner and I just I was really frightened at that point and I couldn't believe it. From Danielle's perspective and witness testimony from their children, life inside the family home was toxic with both parents contributing to the unhealthy environment, especially when alcohol was involved. Michael had returned to the family home just one month before his death. Danielle asserted this was due to her yielding to his demands to prevent losing custody of her children. However, she acknowledged the likelihood of their marriage not continuing much longer. During the period when Danielle filed for divorce, she started setting up profiles on dating sites. Although she never met any men from these sites, she exchanged messages with multiple individuals. 
According to Danielle, the altercation that led to Michael's death began when he discovered one of these messages on her phone, which enraged him. At the time, Danielle had briefly left the house to get dinner from McDonald's. Upon her return, she found Michael intoxicated and in a violent state. At around 10 p.m., she goes to McDonald's. After McDonald's, she heads home. And Michael is there. He is pounding down the vodka. He grabs her food, and then he goes at her. He is in a rage, and this rage is the angriest that she has ever seen him. It's worse than any of those other incidents. It's different. He pushes her down. She goes to her knees. He pulls her up by the hair. He shoves her to the kitchen island. He chokes. He smothers her. She reaches into a drawer. She grabs a knife. She stabs him one time. He is stunned. He releases her and she runs to the bathroom. When it was her turn to testify regarding the events leading to Michael's death, Danielle calmly described the events of the night of January 11th, 2019. You find the knife. You're able to open the drawer? Yes. You're able to grab the knife? Pull it out, yes. How does it continue from there? Um, pull the knife out and I don't know if he saw it, but he released my head, so I'm able to move. Okay. How, how do you position? So you said that he, you're able to move a little bit. What position do you go Just into? Slightly more to the left, turning toward him. Does he back away from you? No. Okay. How, go ahead. He says, what are you going to stab me? And I take the knife and I position it and face it toward him. What does he do at that point? He immediately just goes for my chin and pushes me back and I, that's, and I stab him at that point. How are you positioned at the point of stabbing him? Basically on the back of the island um, and, and pinned by him. At that point, are you able to get out? After I stab him, yes. Prior to doing that, prior to stabbing him with a knife, are you able to remove yourself? No. Are you able to wiggle free? No. Are you able to get out without using a weapon? No, I was trying. Are you able to talk to him? The defense relied on the assertion of years of a toxic and abusive marriage, presenting Danielle's violence as a response to the circumstances that ultimately led to Michael's death. On the other hand, the prosecution constructed a compelling case against Danielle, accusing her of second-degree murder. According to their perspective, the evidence portrayed Danielle as callous and calculating, willing to fabricate stories to evade responsibility for her actions. They argued that her actions weren't in self-defense but rather deliberate retaliation for Michael's unfaithfulness. The prosecution contended that Danielle sought to exit the marriage quickly and pursue a new relationship. They scrutinized every aspect of her account of the events of that fateful night. You have told this jury that he has taken a bite of your hamburger, correct? Yes. And then he spits it at you, yes. right? It's at this point that you stand up and you grab that McDonald's bag and such, and you begin to throw it on the counter or the island, right? Right. Mr. Redlick is behind you. Yes. And you feel yourself get hit in the head. He grabs me and I fall. Then I get hit in the head. I thought you, stum you stumbled. Yeah, well, he grabbed me first, which I tried to turn, and then I tripped up on my feet and fell. You, so you fall, and then it's, it's while you are still on the ground that you feel something hit your head. Yes. Well, could you tell if it was an object or a, or a fist or something else? Elbow, fist, I don't know what it was. But not like a, a blunt object, like a bat or a mallet? I didn't think it was an object, no. It's at that point that you are pulled back up by your hair? Is that what happens next? Well, I attempted to get up on my own, and he was too far on top of me, so. Where are you at when he's now too far on top of you? Coming up, trying to get up off the ground. Where specifically? Where specifically, or is he too far on top of you to um, get on top of you? So am I using this? Permission to allow the witness to use the laser pointer, Your Honor? Um, yes, that's fine. What I do this? I might need to turn it on for you. Uh, put the laser pointer to where you were whenever he was too far on top of you for you to get up, please. 
I'm in this corridor between here and here. Okay. So, facing that way, on my knees. On your knees, facing towards the uh, cabinets on the far wall where the scale is at. Yes? And um, when you say he's too on top of you to get up, is he actually standing, he's standing over you at this point? Yes. And is it this point that he picks you up and by the hair? No, I, I'm going to get up like this, and I don't know where exactly he's at, but he's, I know his head slammed into my head. So as you're getting up, you feel your head on his head? I feel the back of my head on his head. Then, and then it's at that point that he takes your head and he slams it onto the uh, stovetop area. Yes? No, I wouldn't say right at that point, no. Um, I reached up. And with my right hand to pull myself up. And as I'm pulling myself up and trying to turn around to face him, that's when he grabbed my hair and slammed my head onto the... Slams you, slams your head into the stovetop, yes? Yes. And at this point, you have a 6'1", 240-pound man uh, pressed against your body, yes? Yes. Pressing you against that island. Yes. The next thing that you say happens is that he begins to take his fist and he's rubbing it in your face. That was your story, right? Took my head and he held it down. It was a very awkward position. I couldn't move because it was A, hurting. And yes, he had me pinned, so he, had it, he held my head down first. So your neck is sort of like cr cricked against the corner of that island at that point? Yes. Now he's using this force to keep your head down. Mm -hmm. Yes. And he is still on top of you. His, his 240 pound body is still pressing you into that island. Yes. You can feel the island on your body. Yes. This is when the, the rubbing happens? Yes. He doesn't, he doesn't hit you. He doesn't punch me, no. Well, he hit me in the back of the head, but in the back, where, you're, where your hair covers, correct? Yes. From the skin that's exposed, he doesn't, he doesn't strike. And then it, it, is it at this moment that he decides that he's going to um, put his hands over your nose and mouth? Yes. During the trial, the prosecution challenged Danielle's claims, arguing that her justifications and explanations didn't align with the concept of self-defense. They highlighted the suspicious nature of Danielle's actions, particularly her decision to wait 11 hours before contacting 911. From their perspective, this delay raised questions about her innocence. They argued that an innocent victim would have sought help immediately, and the delay ultimately cost Michael his life as it deprived him of a chance for timely intervention. During the trial, Danielle asserted that after stabbing Michael and breaking free from his grasp, she sought refuge in the bathroom out of fear for her life, unaware of the severity of Michael's injuries. However, the prosecution highlighted inconsistencies in Danielle's statements, particularly her initial claim to the 911 operator that Michael had suffered a heart attack, followed by the assertion that he had stabbed himself during the altercation, both of which were later admitted as untrue. Danielle defended these falsehoods, attributing them to shock and confusion in the immediate aftermath of the stabbing. She maintained that she was scared and disoriented, struggling to articulate her thoughts accurately when calling for help. Despite her explanations, lingering questions remained unanswered. Investigators discovered deleted texts on Danielle's phone sent while Michael lay dead on the kitchen floor. Additionally, evidence from her phone indicated activity on a dating site while Michael was dying. The prosecution argued that these actions contradicted Danielle's claim of being too shocked to call for help. To strengthen their case, they called on Jaden, one of the couple's daughters, to testify. Although her identity was protected due to her age at the time, Jaden's testimony painted a different picture of Danielle as the aggressor in their fights, describing her as toxic and manipulative. In contrast, Jaden depicted her father as attentive and loving, revealing their close bond. Jaden says, my dad and I were very close. We practically did everything together. He took me out on daddy-daughter dates all the time. We were very close. I told him everything. Prosecutor, what was your relationship like with your mother? Jaden, very toxic, very manipulative. Prosecutor, what was the relationship like between your parents? Jaden, very toxic, tumultuous, very rocky. Yeah, it was not a good relationship, very rocky. Prosecutor, 
Who was the primary source? Jaden, my mother. Prosecutor, why do you say that? Jaden, if there was an issue between them, it would be brought up by my mother. Jaden, when he came home, he was very distant. And this is what she's talking about, I believe, the night of. Not very talkative. He was very cold when he came home. Prosecutor, did you sense tension? Jaden, yes. Prosecutor, did it turn into an argument? Jaden, yes. It was very rare for me to see him get angry and upset. That night, he told me he was sorry, that he loved me, and he wished I hadn't seen him like that. The next day, I went to school, and those were the last words we ever exchanged. I didn't answer him then. Jaden, the last thing I said to him was when they were arguing the night before. Jaden, I received a text from my mom saying she was dealing with something here and that it was best for me to stay at my friend's another night. I thought that was odd because my mom usually wanted to pick me up right after a sleepover. Prosecutor, when was the next time you spoke to your mother? Jaden, sometime later that week. I believe she called me from the hospital. Prosecutor, did she tell you what happened to your father? And this is important, folks. Listen, Jaden, no, I don't think so. Prosecutor, did you later ask her what happened to your father? Jaden, I remember her exact words were, the autopsy said he had a heart attack. Prosecutor, I have no other questions for this witness. As the prosecution rested its case, the outcome remained uncertain. Both the defense and prosecution had presented contrasting portrayals of Danielle Redlick and her motivations for stabbing Michael and concealing the crime. Acknowledging the toxicity and unhappiness of the marriage, the jury faced a crucial decision, whether to believe the testimony of a woman claiming self-defense after enduring years of abuse or side with the prosecution's depiction of a victim, unable to defend himself against a deceitful and self-serving murderer. Ultimately, the jury had to determine the truth behind Michael's death and where accountability lay. The trial gathered international attention, sparking debates on internet forums regarding the possible verdict. After just two days of deliberation, the courtroom fell silent as the verdict was announced. In the Circuit Court of the Ninth Judicial Circuit in and for Orange County, Florida, case number 2019, CF18460, State of Florida versus Danielle Justine Redlin. Verdict as to count one, we the jury find the defendant not guilty. So say we all sign juror badge number 283, person. In response to the acquittal, an emotional statement from Danielle and Michael's daughter, Jaden, was read by her attorney in court. I want to start this off by saying the only reason I am not personally reading this statement to you all myself is because I simply do not ever want to be in a room with Daniel Drohan ever again. I feel as though there has been absolutely no justice served for my father or his family, including myself and my younger brother. It takes a lot for me to talk about these things and be so vulnerable in front of total strangers. <clears throat> so I uh, please just ask that you all listen to me and please take my feelings into consideration. Since I was about seven years old, I have endured insane amounts of trauma. <clears throat> This trauma all stems from the same thing, Danielle Drohan. And yes, I'm referring to her as her first name and maiden name because I feel as though she should not even have the privilege of having the same last name as me or my father. <clears throat> I refuse to call her mother because she was never a decent mother figure to me. There were a great deal of things I was not permitted to say in court when I was testifying, which I feel is absolutely insane. I still am unable to even scratch the mere surface of the trauma I am referring to. <clears throat> All I want is justice for my father. It breaks my heart into a million pieces over and over to hear people side with such an abusive, horrible person and then continue to bash on a dead man who isn't here to defend himself. Sure, my dad was no angel <clears throat> and definitely had faults, but he was the kindest, most caring person, and I'm sure the other people who had the chance to know him would vouch for that. He was so kind 
gentle, and he never laid a hand on a single person in my family, not myself, Sawyer, or Danielle. I don't even remember him spanking me. My dad always advocated for love and acceptance. He loved everyone and treated everyone the way he wanted to be treated. He was a great man <clears throat> with great values and loved his family. He would never hit a woman. He took my brother and I to so many different ball games, always took me out on our father-daughter days, <clears throat> and he was always in a good mood. Him and I used to watch Saturday Night Live together every Saturday for five years straight. He took me and Sawyer to the movies all the time and made sure we were always happy, fed, and well taken care of. <clears throat> he always stood up for others. He always wanted to joke around and play whatever game or talk about literally anything. He loved to talk, people watch, and get to know people. He loved others, <clears throat> and everyone loved him. He was not a bad person. I am so angry about the way he has been portrayed, so extremely angry. He was the best dad I ever could have asked for. I remember at certain points, I would imagine Sawyer and I staying with him full time if my parents were to divorce. <clears throat> I have no regret in saying that, and I mean it wholeheartedly. It absolutely breaks my heart into a million pieces that Sawyer has to grow up without him. I do too, but Sawyer no longer has the amazing dad to show him how to grow up and be just like him. <clears throat> we are both extremely heartbroken to have our pops ripped from our world so suddenly and to have been lied to about it for so long after. We miss our pops so much. I would do anything to bring him back. Someone took him from our world and ruined our childhoods, let alone the start of our lives and, and futures. We have endured so much since he was taken from us that it has been difficult to process a natural grieving process. We have suffered such incredible amounts of trauma to the point where our bodies have reacted to it. I have had nightmares for the past three years about Danielle and more specifically about certain decisions she has made. Sawyer has nightmares too. I have developed a near fear of being murdered. I have had phases of extreme paranoia and I've gone through phases where I've been so depressed over the situation that I was unable to take care of myself for a long time. I've lost a great amount of weight, and for a while, I would get extremely triggered and break down over someone even saying the words dad or parent. I've had an entire school gossip about me and my situation, as most of Winter Park. People recognize my last name and often already know about this so-called news story that is my life. I lost everything at once, and it was broadcasted to the world, and I have always given the short end of the stick. I am just now getting to be okay again, but this reopened so many wounds that I genuinely thought could start to heal from. You may all be fooled by the incredible mask this woman presents to you all, but I am not. My father did not get away in time. I am not worried. I am so worried for my brother. Judge, please make some kind of stipulation that Danielle not be allowed near myself and Sawyer so we don't have to be re-traumatized re like we have been already. We're both settled into our new life without our dad, and we want to be left in peace. It took us a while to get here, and we deserve that at the very least. Although Danielle was acquitted of murder, she still faced sentencing for the other crimes of which she had been found guilty, specifically tampering with evidence. 
investigators had demonstrated that she had cleaned up the blood and moved Michael's body after his death. According to the crime scene pictures and evidence, blood stains were smeared throughout the home. You used bleach and other cleaners to clean what looked like a horror scene. Crime scene photographs also showed where you left the cleanup towels and a bucket of colored water. The blood pattern expert testified that typically blood, blood patterns could tell a story or explain the circumstances surrounding a homicide crime scene like this, but not so in your case. The expert also testified that as a result of your conduct, it was virtually impossible to determine the exact circumstances surrounding Michael Redwood's death. The scene was tampered with so much so that the blood evidence was of little to no value to determine what happened between the night of January 11th of 2019 and mid-morning, January 12th of 2019. You've already been adjudicated guilty of count two, tampering with physical evidence, and so for that conduct, I will sentence you to 364 days in the Orange County Jail with credit for 364 days time served. That's going to be followed by a period of 12 months of probation. You will report to probation by 3 p.m. The office is on the seventh floor of the side courtroom 7B. Within the first 30 days, you will sign up for and you will submit to a mental health evaluation and complete the evaluation and any required treatment within 12 months. I will impose court costs, and there is also a public defender lien that should be imposed. Court costs of $418. Mr. Parnell and Ms. Conlon, for the public defender lien, what do you feel is an appropriate cost for your services for the trial and the litigation? On January 18th, 2022, Danielle was released from Orange County Jail after spending nearly 1,100 days in custody while awaiting trial. Remember, it's your curiosity that fuels this channel. Keep exploring, stay inspired, and join us for more amazing content next time.